the 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 quest the quest for any the quest to fight inequality or the quest to um what's the word to create equality i believe that quest is over i really do i believe that we as a society are not going to really ever achieve equality because we're t we're headed too far down that capitalist path um and if you look at most indicators you look at where wealth is distributed in this country um, it's distributed very heavily toward uh, a, a smaller and smaller minority of society. And this minority is not willing to give up that power easily or readily at all. And so what's happened is you're dancing, you're in this dumb dance, you're in this dumb little dance where you really are sort of led to believe that participation in uh, economics, uh, you know, economic, you know, excuse me, in politics is really going to change that. And I just don't believe that it is. Somebody says, does Antonio feel that we're wasting our time? Antonio um, has a different ideology. I think Antonio kind of sees the black wealth issue, the wealth gap is kind of a lost cause that, you know, that, you know, that there's no point in us trying to build or, or educate ourselves. That's not going to make up the difference. And I think that's you have to be really careful because that kind of thinking, which is in alignment with what a lot of liberals say, is uh, is it's not so uh, it's not that it's totally incorrect, but it's a problem because anybody who tells you that you sh that, that you should just give up. Uh, you know, trying that education doesn't matter and, you know, et cetera, is not really your friend. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, I don't think that's what Antonio believes because Antonio himself is an educated person. I'm talking about Antonio Moore, um, who, who writes about this a lot. He, he, we're kind of in disagreement, but we're not in complete disagreement. But, you know, I, I think that um, we, can, we have to kind of get over this idea that it has to be one or the other, first and foremost. I think it could be both. I think that we can um, we can fight for equality. You know, we can go vote if you want to. You can go participate in the, you know, in, in the in the protests and all that. But you have to also start at home. I believe that your greatest indicator of where you're going to end up as a family, as a community, as as a people is going to be determined by, by what you do in your house, what you do at home. Um, I don't know a single person who isn't sharp as hell, who doesn't work their ass off, who doesn't study wealth to the nth degree, who walks around and is flat out broke. You know, I guarantee you, I guarantee you this. If black people, if black people, if all black people, 95 percent or 100 percent of black people committed to making sure that their child knew entrepreneurship as well as they know basketball and football and hip and entertainment, we would literally take over the wealth race in about a generation or two. We might not have all the money, but the trend would be sort of slanted in our direction. Like uh, India and China. India and China have not passed the United States in terms of per capita income. China as a collective has passed the United States in terms of total GDP. But China and India um, are, are still behind technically on a per capita basis. But the difference is that they're catching up to us so fast that you can look at, at the trajectory and you know, you know, based on the direction that they're headed that they're going to be whooping our ass about, about the year 2060. Why is that? Well, because they are educating the living shit out of their children. They are making sure their kids are so on point that your child don't even know what the hell hit them. Your child sitting in the class next to a Chinese person that came, you know, that was one of the best top students in China. They will literally be stunned. And I know this. I sat next to people like this. When I got my Ph.D. in finance, we attracted some of the brightest scholars on the planet. Some of the baddest sons of bitches you ever seen in your life. Guys from Russia, where all they would do is sit down and study 15 hours a day and memorize the entire math book line by line. I had never seen that before. So finance attracts people like that because we have the highest salaries. When I was a finance professor, I was the highest paid uh, assistant or associate professor at Syracuse University, even though I was only an assistant. You have to get a promotion to be an associate. Uh, so finance uh, pays a lot of money. So we would draw the best talent in the world. And I remember sitting in class with some girl who was like, oh, Oh, yeah, I got the second highest math score in all of China. Another guy from Russia was literally the, just the most precise, maniacal thinker I've ever seen in my life. I'd never seen that in the U.S. because Americans are lazy as shit. Americans are lazy as. I'm not going to say lazy as fuck. I was about to say lazy as fuck. I don't want to do that. I'm trying not to cuss. Whew. See, is, you see how hard it is for me not to let it out. It's so hard. Anyway. <laughs> Americans are lazy. So Americans are going to get their asses kicked. We are going to get body slammed by the rest of the world. These little hungry kids in China and in India and other third world countries where their governments have got on the same page, where they say, we don't care if you ain't got a nickel in your pocket, you still got enough money to sit down and open up a damn book. 
You might not have no, you might not have a whole lot of, you might not have no iPhones and iPods and Nike sneakers, but you can open up that book and you can make yourself into the leading expert on any topic that you choose. You can do that. That's your prerogative. You got a smartphone, that smartphone, I got my phone somewhere. I'm looking at it. See, that's how crazy I am. But you got a smartphone. That smartphone is a university that's in your pocket. It's up to you to decide if you're using it to dig up information or if you're using it to take dumbass selfies and, and, and look at comedy videos all day or watch fights on World Star. It's your decision. Your decision. So what I think we need to do is get over American laziness and entitlement and us just thinking that somehow because we're American, we're supposed to be exceptional because the rest of the world is catching up with you and killing you. They're looking at y'all like you are a bunch of retards. They're looking at you thinking, holy crap, these people have all the money, all the power. They got all the resources and they're still not learning. They're not learning because they haven't understood. They've never been taught that learning ain't about the resources. Learning is about the desire. Learning is about the interest that you have in picking up knowledge, period. And so what I'm rolling toward, what I'm aiming toward, what I want to implement is a complete total undeniable, uh, un, 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 you know, unforgettable, just un, un, what is it? What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, unapologetic commitment to black exceptionalism. I'm looking for black people to look, look around the world, look at exceptional people, look at groups of people where they just sort of said together, we're just going to be the best in the world at this. And I want us to adopt that in our DNA. We already do that. See, that's the thing. We've already done that when it comes to um, when it comes to sports. We are the ex most exceptional basketball and football players ever. You know, I mean, you look at a kid that's on the basketball court eight hours a day who takes a basketball with him wherever he goes, who's talking to his boys about basketball, who's watching ESPN every single night. That kid is is internalizing basketball at a DNA, at a molecular level to the point where it's just in his blood. And he says, it's just in my blood. To I don't know how I do what I do. I just do it. It's just in my DNA. Right. Well, why can't we be the same way when it comes to knowledge, entrepreneurship and wealth building and things like that? Why can't we have the same level of excellence in all those areas? You know, so I will just tell you that um, that we can win this race. You see, there's going to be a race for wealth and power in this country and abroad. Um, the wealth gap is is getting wider. Um, people are getting greedier. Uh, the wealthy are getting stingier. Um, they care less and less about you every single day. Um, you can keep on voting for the right politicians. You can keep on praying to Jesus. You can keep on going to every march and rally that you can, that you want to. But I'm going to tell you what, it's going to be a fight. At the end of the day, you're going to have to fight for what you want. And I just believe that black people, e either as a collective or as individuals, maybe the collective isn't going to go with you. You know, maybe you're just your family will just be the family that has the wealthy dynasty. And you're going to have to go hire a bunch of people whose families didn't prepare them for what was coming down the road. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to get worse. America is only going to get worse. America is not built as a as a touchy feely society. It's built as like greedy as a greedy society and so um if, if you don't get with the program you're gonna get killed that's why i don't i don't mess with these liberals i'm sorry i did they i don't want to talk on the phone with you no i don't want to do, join up with you, with you whatever you're doing i'll support it okay all right human rights and okay i support all that yeah let me sign the petition but when i get with my family and my kids i'm talking to them about competition I'm talking to them. We have family meetings every week where we talk about wealth and uh, not just wealth, but our family businesses. And our circle isn't that big. It's about eight people in it. We invite a couple of friends of the family and we get together and we talk about what we're working on individually, what we're going to do collectively. And we think of ourselves as a multi-billion dollar corporation. That's how we see ourselves, because we know that we are planting the seeds for a dynasty that will last over several generations. Do you understand? So I just tell you the truth. Honest to God, at the end of the day. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be a war out here. You know, and a lot of black people ain't going to be ready. A lot of these kids ain't ready. A lot of these kids come out of school, can't read. Um, and it's not just not being able to read is not the crime. You can you can make up for that. You can catch up. The uh, guy who um, I know a guy who runs a major corporation that's worth billions of dollars. I can't say his name now because I don't know if he's told anybody this. But when he was young, he couldn't read. But now he's a CEO of a corporation that I know you've heard of that makes billions of dollars all around the world. And there was a time where he couldn't read. <laughs> But he said, I'm, I'm determined. I'm going to teach myself to read. I'm going to find a way to make this work. Um, so uh, 
let me tell you this. Um, if you want to check out some of the stuff that we have, the like programs, all that stuff, write this URL down. Go to blackfinancialliteracy.com. That's blackfinancialliteracy.com. Uh, one thing that we have for those of you that are either starting businesses or trying to develop your businesses is we actually have something called the um, the Dr. Boyce, Dr. Boyce Watkins Academy, where basically uh, one of the offerings of the Dr. Boyce Watkins Academy is the 48-hour business school. And the 48-hour business school is where um, I will get together with some people in a hotel for 48 hours, and we're going to work on your business. You bring your business idea, lay out the, the, the framework. There's some work to do in, the, in advance, and then you get there. We work step by step through your business, myself and some experts, and we get you to where when you walk out the door, your business is functional and operational. So if you're kind of dragging your feet, if you're not sure, if you don't know how to get it finished or whatever, we can help you do go in for the kill. And then also there's other things, other offers that we have in terms of um, ways you can actually get long-term support, advertising, things like that. That URL is uh, the number 48. That's 48hourbusinessschool.com. So if you're interested, you want to meet with a specialist to see if you qualify, go to 48 Hour Business School. Uh, the, the number 48 all right so anyway um you know let me let me grab let me grab this book you know this is the book i love it's a uh, black labor white wealth by dr claude anderson um I, I one of the things i really believe is i believe that every white liberal who wants to be down with black people should read this book uh because i really think that um liberals who talk about racism see they use racism a lot to fulfill their own agenda, they use the word. They use racism a lot because they hate Donald Trump and they want to, you know, sort of say whatever they want to say about him or whatever. And so it's funny because I know a lot of black people who feel that he's clearly racist. And I, I'll ask him, well, what did he do against you as a black person uh, that that makes you that makes him racist? And a lot of people really don't know. They can't really tell you. So um, anyway, my point in all that is to say it's not to say Trump is racist or not racist. Is to say that for black people, you've got to know the difference between what you believe versus versus what uh, what they they tell you to believe, right? So let me um, let me uh, t say this: um, any liberals who want to talk about racism and want to use that to their advantage in order to fulfill their agenda, uh, don't talk about racism unless you're ready to talk about reparations. If you ain't ready to really talk about reparations and the trillions that are owed to black people. Um, then you, you're not really talking about racism in America. You're not talking about true equality. I want to talk about race. I want to talk about reparations for descendants, descendants of slaves. I don't want to talk about some sort of uh, ambiguous coalition of anybody who's not a white man. No, no, no. I don't give a fuck about that. I want to talk about reparations. I want to talk about the trillions in wealth that has proven without, without a doubt, indisputed. This is undisputed. You can't, you can't dispute me on this. The trillions in documented wealth that has been stolen from black people that is old. Uh, if you want to talk about uh, reconciliation and all this other stuff, then you must talk about complete redemption. You can't talk about just you, let's get together at the Dr. King dinner every year and hold hands saying we shall overcome. Fuck you. I don't want to talk about that. My community suffering. My community is struggling because you took everything that we had and you ain't gave it back. So your, your ass is sitting over there in a big house uh, running a major corporation sitting on millions of dollars, multi-billion dollar endowments of major universities that benefited from slave labor, and you have not talked for one second about giving back what you stole. So until and unless you have that honest conversation with us, um, I don't want to hear a single thing you have to say. No, I'm not going to join your coalition. I don't want to be a part of whatever you're talking about. I'm not interested in hearing any of that until you have a conversation about reparations and it is an authentic discussion and it is something that actually leads to um, leads to actual action on your part. Now, uh, with that being said, I just had to make sure I said that because I need them to hear that because they, they come in there and they, 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 they want to reach out and talk to me. And I'm not the guy. I'm just he's probably maybe van jones or something van jones would be good for that you talk to him van van is smarter than me he ain't you know me i'm alienating people van makes friends and that's why van's doing well he's on cnn uh and god bless him for that i actually like van jones i really do but uh, one area that we're not in agreement on in alignment on is that i you know when i see black people on tv usually there's an implicit contract where they will talk about every other issue for every other group except black people black people kind of fit in kind of as an extra right maybe we'll talk about police killings or something like that which is very important but you're not talking about the true wealth gap uh you know reparations for descendants of slaves you know talking about what's really happening in black communities you're not having honest conversations about urban violence because you feel somehow that you're violating the liberal code by talking about what the black community really needs to do to really address this in a meaningful way um, I don't think 
think <clears throat> we can pretend like the urban violence isn't real. It's very, very real. Um, and, and sometimes there are some black people that need to be confronted as well as white people. Uh, in Chicago, it's not an accident that all the deaths and all the killings happen outside of the north side. The north side is very safe, very clean. Nobody nobody gets messed with in the north side of Chicago. Nobody gets shot up every day in the north side of Chicago. Go to the south side, go to the west side, then suddenly bullets are everywhere. How does that happen? It happens because your so-called democratic leadership uh, and some of your black leaders, some of your black politicians are allowing the drug trade to occur in some neighborhoods, but not allowing it to occur in others. They're allowing homicides to occur in some neighborhoods, but not letting it happen in others. They're policing certain ways in some neighborhoods, but not policing the same way in others. That's why it's all going down. And and I believe in having honest conversations. And I really think that if you're if you're hamstrung by this liberal conservative bullshit this whole like either i'm a democrat or i'm a republican i'm down for hillary i'm down for trump if you're hamstrung by that you can't get to the truth ben carson for example is a victim of his commitment to the republican party and to donald trump because ben carson is a black man who i truly believe actually really cares about black people i don't care what nobody says i read his i read some of his stuff i followed this man i believe ben carson really believes that what he's doing is going to help black people and i believe that's why he does it but the problem is he had to lock himself in with these racist Republicans uh, who don't care about black people. And it ends up becoming a messy situation that makes Ben get reduced from a brilliant man to a cartoon character because he's up here running behind Donald Trump because Donald Trump has all the wealth and all the power. Same thing is true with liberals. A lot of these liberals look like freaking clowns run up here trying to get all get get black people riled up on every little issue because they don't really want your issues. They want your votes. That's what they want. They don't want your problems. They want your support. You know, so that's what so what basically they will do is they'll run around and, and, and take up every cause except for the one that actually matters to black people. Um, anyway, um, so let me um, let me do a comparison. Let me let me just talk to you about slavery. Let, let's talk about slavery. So if, if you have black labor, white wealth, if you have followed this, then you may have your book nearby. Just so you know, when you come into my podcast, I'm really hoping that you come with a pad, a, a pad and a pen. In a book, like some some one of the books, I'm usually going to reference Black Labor, White Wealth. Sometimes I'll reference Poweronomics. I, I won't reference my books very much because uh, I want to give uh, pledge allegiance to Dr. Claude Anderson. Um, my own ideas are out there. You know, I've got my own stuff out there, but I, I really just admire this man so much. I want to start here. Um, and also, so if you want to see other books I recommend in addition to these two, or you want to get a copy of either one of these books, you can go to the drboycelibrary.com. That's the drboycelibrary.com. All right, so let's talk about slavery. Now, on page 75, Dr. Anderson actually does a comparison of slavery. Um, you know, a lot of black people don't know that actually um, ancient slavery, that other kinds of slavery were not as bad as the slavery you went through. That not only were you um, did you have your freedom taken away, but you had your freedom taken away by people who um, were abusive and chaotic animals, who literally were about the most savage human beings that you can ever imagine. Um, and he does a comparison, a really good comparison, Table 2 on page 75 of Black Labor, White Wealth, where he compares ancient enslavement to colonial black enslavement. So let me give some you some quick compa comparisons. He says in ancient enslavement, blacks or slaves' basic rights were honored. In colonial enslavement, blacks black slaves had no rights. So ancient enslavement said you had some rights. Uh, in America, you had none. Uh, next, ancient enslavement. The Catholic Church accepted slaves as humans and intervened on their behalf. So the Catholic Church uh, knew that the slaves were human. They intervened on, in, intervened on their behalf. In colonial enslavement, most religions supported black slavery including Catholicism, and intervened on behalf of the slaveholders offering biblical justification. So these Catholics, who the Catholic Church could have easily intervened in the slavery conversation. They could have easily took a stand, easily stopped slavery, because people would turn to the church as kind of a moral compass. Like, okay, you know, Pope, what, what should I do? I'm having this moral dilemma. I don't know if it's right to, to rape and castrate black people and keep them enslaved and torture these people, so what should I do? Well, the church could have easily stepped in and said, that's wrong. Right. But they didn't. They didn't. They stepped in and said, ah, you know, well, according to the Bible, it says, blah, 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 all that, you know, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And therefore, uh, they justified the slavery. So so it's almost like um, have you ever seen a situation where maybe a young person has an ethical dilemma and they talk to their parent and their parent could easily get them to change their decision one way or the other. And the parent uh, makes the wrong move. So the Catholic Church is on the wrong side of history as far as slavery is concerned. Um 
Next, uh, slavery, ancient slavery, was viewed as a temporary and unfortunate social condition. So you might be a slave for a while until your condition was over. In America, black slavery was permanent and inherited. That means that you're, you're a slave for life. If your mama was a slave, then you're going to be a slave too. Um, next, in ancient slavery, governments did not use their power to exploit any racial group for private wealth and power. In America, European nations and colonial powers conspired to manipulate and enslave blacks in order to develop the new world and colonize Africa. So all this in America, all this stuff that you have right now, all this wealth, all this power, is, is something that would not exist had you not taken black slaves. The first real wealth in America was wealth that came from us, the ownership of us. And so uh, if you're not willing to talk about making that right and reconciling that, then you're not our friend. You're, you're proving that you're still our enemy. Uh, you're still not committed to true justice in this country. That's just, I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, you get, don't get mad at me for saying it. Get mad at your ancestors for doing it. You know, like if I get mad at you because you tell me that my daddy allegedly raped somebody or whatever and there's proof that he did it, don't, I can't get mad at you. I might get mad at you because I feel like, well, you're telling me stuff about my daddy I don't want to hear. But the fact is I need to get mad at my daddy for, for what he did. Right. So you need to get mad at your ancestors. Don't get don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me for telling you the truth. But that's what America does. We kill the messenger. Um, by the way, if you want to, we still have our black wealth calendars. Today's the last day to order them and still get them before Christmas. Uh, the black wealth calendar. I think I have a calendar somewhere so you can see it. The black wealth calendar is something you can kind of hang up on your refrigerator. Uh, and, it, and I think it's a really important step in kind of knowing how to make wealth building kind of part of your culture. Um, I believe if you see it every day in the morning. The reason I, I told my team to help me design this calendar is because I felt that if you see it every day on your refrigerator, then it'll sink into your subconscious. So every month, like July is investing month. So there's a quote there. There's also three tips on investing. And every day as your child is going by and looking at the calendar, they're going to see these tips every single day. And I guarantee you that over time, these tips are going to sink into their subconscious. The thing about wealth building is that a lot of people think that finance and money are complicated. And I guess I would think that they were complicated if I didn't know what I knew, if I hadn't been teaching it for 23 years. But it doesn't come off as complicated to me because sometimes when you understand a, a subject really well, you know how to, um, what's the word? Uh, you know how to take the complicated and make it simple again. So basically, um, I know how to make the complicated simple. And that's the best thing I can offer you. And so in the calendar, for example, December is plant the seed month. So basically it's all about sort of building your own family empire. I really want black people to have family empires. If you and, and everybody can have it, everybody, everybody, you know, think about how much you how much respect and deference you have for uh, things, traditions in your family that your grandma might have set up, things you might have been doing in your family since the 80s or or whatever, or things that you consider to be sacred, you know, things that you um, have seen your parents and grandparents do maybe for the past 25 years every year y'all get together for Christmas or every Sunday you get together at grandma's house for dinner or you've been going to the same church for so long so that church becomes an institution well, or you all went to the same high school or whatever it is uh, what I really really want is I want to see every family institutionalize themselves I want you to realize that most institutions that you admire and that you love are actually fabrications of somebody's imagination Everything, everything from from IBM uh, and Facebook to uh, the Grammy Awards to uh, Ralph Lauren. All of that started. And in fact, I knew a guy who went to school with Tommy Hilfiger. I met a rich, a Jewish guy who uh, on the airplane who said he went to school with Tommy Hilfiger. And it's funny because at that time he said nobody really thought Tommy, the name Tommy Hilfiger meant anything. Right. But now people talk about the name Tommy Hilfiger like Tommy Hilfiger is some kind of a god. Right. And so uh, at the end of the day, um, I think it's important for us to understand that somebody says, do I have a copy of the calendar on my website? You can actually order the calendar at the black wealth calendar dot com. That's the black wealth calendar dot com. Somebody type that in. So I, uh, and I'll repeat it one more time. It's the black wealth calendar dot com. So please uh, take a look and they make great Christmas gifts. So you can order a bunch of them for Christmas. And that actually helps us because we 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 um, if you want to know where the money goes, it's, imp I, it's important for me to share that with you because people think. Oh, my God, if you sell something, you must be a crook. If you're a black business owner, you must be robbing black people. And that's not true. We sell, we, we sell education so that money gets flipped into paying for our tour around the world. We're going to go all over the all over the country. We're also this year going to go to London and spread the gospel of black economic empowerment. We're also going to have the all black national convention this year. We're going to we're making really great kick ass movies. Um, we've got uh, disintegration coming out. 
of disintegration is all about integration and how integration wasn't necessarily good for black people. We've got escaping the corporate plantation coming out, which is all about black listening to black people who've escaped the corporate plantation, how they did it, how they became successful. We've got the film with myself and Yvette Carnell called um, Democracy, the Black American Horror Story. And it talks about black survival in a democratic society, just sort of what that looks like. I want to do, we've all already got the secrets of black financial intelligence, uh, which you actually can watch the trailer for that at blackfinancialintelligence.com. That's blackfinancialintelligence.com. Now let me keep going. I'm on page 75 of Black Labor, White Wealth, in case you just chimed in. Make sure that you subscribe, make sure that you share, make sure you invite your followers if you have not done so yet. Or if you already have, do it again, please. I, I think that would be very helpful. Um, uh, so anyway, okay, so let me jump back in here. All right, so here, here's the comparison on page 75 where uh, Dr. Anderson says, somebody says, block the trolls. You know, maybe I should, maybe I should block the trolls. I, I don't know. Somebody says, I make lipstick and cologne starting now. Okay, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't read all the, I can't tell which comments are from trolls. So maybe the trolls can like identify yourselves or something. I and I'm 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 not I just I'm immune to trolls. I, they don't really bother me that much. So I say we just focus on doing what we got to do and learn how to ignore. In fact, that's good training. I don't know if y'all know this, but um, Tiger Woods, when his daddy was training him to be the greatest golfer in the history of the world, he used to deliberately distract him. Like he would deliberately make noise while he was trying to swing. He would yell while in the mid swing, all that, so that his son would learn how to focus. And what I want y'all to do as black people is I want you to learn how to focus. So the trolls don't exist if you unless you allow them to exist. They don't matter unless you allow them to matter. The trolls are like children. You know, if you got a child that's saying some dumbass childish shit, are you really gonna treat the child like they're an adult? Or are you gonna just keep doing grown up shit and let the children be children? All right, okay, so let's hop back in here. All right. Um so on page seventy five of Black Labor White Wealth, there's a comparison of ancient enslavement and colonial enslavement. What other people went through in slavery. This is important for you to know so that when somebody says, well, you know, other people have been slaves too. And it wasn't that bad. But you can say, actually, according to Black Labor, White Wealth, on page 75, there are numerous comparisons to show that our form of slavery was among the most brutal forms of slavery, if not the most brutal form of slavery uh, in the history of all mankind. So your ancestors paid the price. You might as well get the benefits from it. So now you have the, the moral high ground, if you will, where you can cut, sort of come in and, and chop the balls off. All right. Uh, so, so one other comparison they make is that uh, in ancient enslavement, um, slave ownership was viewed as a status symbol and a measure of the slaveholders existing wealth and power. That was true in ancient enslavement. Now, in colonial enslavement, slaveholding was used as an essential component of capitalism. It empowered even the poorest white to acquire wealth. So basically, it allowed white folks to have a come up, like an easy free come up. You know, like at least you wasn't black. You you own a couple of slaves. You can build wealth off that. I mean, imagine. Think about how hard you work every day. Think about how hard you work, and think about the, the your paycheck that you get every week, right? You, you get your little paycheck. It may be big. It may be small, right? But it's your paycheck. Now imagine if there were three of you working equally hard. And all those paychecks came to you. Imagine if you had quintuplets. So you had three siblings who were out working just as hard as you, earning just as much money as you, and every one of them gave you their paycheck. You would be balling in no time. You could easily become rich and wealthy. And if you did that to them, imagine if you did that to them for their whole life. Don't you think you would owe them something? Don't you think that they have a grievance? They have a right to come back and say, wait a minute. You know, you took all the money. That wasn't right, right? So every human being has a right to their own human capital. That's what it's called. When you make money from your labor, that's called human capital. Um, okay, so what? what's next? Um, in the comparison uh, of, of, of old school slavery versus colonial slavery. In old school slavery or ancient enslavement, slaves were mainly debtors, prisoners of war, or victims of religious persecution. Slaves were mainly debtors, prisoners of war or victims of religious persecution, which means that they were either old money, they were caught up in a war, or somebody, some religion decided to attack them. In America, black enslavement did not result from financial indebtedness, war, or religious perse persecution. Blacks were enslaved because they were black. So being black was enough to, to make you a slave. That's it, pretty much. So ultimately, you know, the slavery that we went through uh, is very different from what other people went through. 
and and I and I, it's, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Next, in ancient enslavement, inferiority stigmas were never permanently assigned to either the slave or his racial or ethnic group. Let me say that again. Inferiority stigmas were never permanently assigned to either the slave or his racial group. In America, the skin color of the black slaves was sensationalized and made into a badge of degradation and permanent inferiority. The skin color of the black slaves was sensationalized and made into a badge of degradation and permanent inferiority. That means that being black meant that even when you weren't a slave anymore, you were still a nigga. And they were always going to treat you as such. That wasn't going to change in your life at all. So what happened? Well, that continues to this day. That's why to this day, people still think black people are less than human. They still think black people are less valuable. They still think black people are inferior. They still think that we are a, of a lower socioeconomic class, not because they decided that, but because it's been true for hundreds of years. So so understand this. I mean, this is different from regular slavery. Next, what, what's another comparison? Now, just so in case you just tuned in, I'm reading from Black Labor, White Wealth by Dr. Claude Anderson. You know, it's one of my favorite books. Uh, you can actually get your copy or also check out other books I recommend by going to the thedrboycelibrary.com. That's the thedrboycelibrary.com. Um, ancient enslavement said that there was no preference for any particular race to serve as slaves. No preference for any particular race to serve as slaves. In colonial slavery, they initially targeted Indians and indentured white servants and then blacks. And let me tell you why they picked you to be the slaves. And this is important for you to understand your greatness. They picked black people to be slaves because slavery, the work in slavery was too difficult. Most of these other groups could not survive all day in the hot sun and work as hard as we worked and not die. We literally survived the unsurvivable. Re, they're, they're Kevin Cosby, the pastor who uh, runs St. Stephen's Church in Kentucky, also he's the president of Simmons College in Kentucky, which is a school I want to do a lot of work with. That's my adopted HBCU. One thing that Kevin Cosby pointed out, he pointed out this book that that, uh, that I that he sent me called Men of Mark. And Men of Mark, in this book, in, in 1887, the author of the book, um, Simmons, his last name was Simmons. I can't remember his first name. Uh, Simmons, who founded Simmons College, he explained black exceptionalism. And he said, what other group of people can go through what we've gone through, the hell that we've gone through for for this long? And just two or three years later, be sitting next to doctors, lawyers, and professors. What other group of people can go through the hell that we went through for so many hundreds of years and still rise to the highest positions in all society? Nobody else can do that. Nobody else has done that. Not in America. Not in America. Nobody's been kicked down the way we have in America. Nobody's been excluded consistently the way we have in America. Nobody's gone through what we've gone through in America. But yet we rise. Yet still we rise. We are extraordinary. You are a superhero. Your melanin makes you one of the most precious and most amazing species on this planet. And it's important that you teach that to your children so that they learn black exceptionalism because they're not going to learn it anywhere else. They're never going to learn how exceptional they are unless you tell them. And you got to tell them that every day. And you have to set high standards so that they commit themselves to a gospel of exceptional behavior, to just being the best at every single thing they do. I don't care if they already own the basketball team, then fine. Keep them on the basketball team, football team, all that. But if they're going to be exceptional in sports, they must be exceptional at everything because you are exceptional people. Nobody can survive what you survive. That's just a fact. It's proven. I'm not making this up. Next, um, in ancient enslavement, the slaveholders allowed slaves to retain their racial identity and dignity. In ancient enslavement, slaveholders allowed slaves to retain their racial identity and dignity. In colonial enslavement, the blacks were psychosocially conditioned to despise themselves. Racial disunity was rewarded. They were in, so in colonial enslavement, you were taught to hate yourself and you were rewarded for being like that stupid ass coon who's out here talking about why it was OK for Walter Scott to be shot in the back. Why it wasn't malicious for that cop to murder him and then plant evidence of uh, uh, the, the taser by his dead body and then file a false police report. But yet some, somehow it, it just I just didn't think it was malicious. What the hell are you talking about? What is wrong with you? 
Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with you. You've been trained over hundreds of years to hate yourself and to hate your people so much that you let these suckers buy you out and get you to go out here and commit one of the most egregious, uh, one of the most egregious acts imaginable. You let this father, this father get shot down in cold blood, get lynched with a gun. He got lynched by a gun. And you saw it on video. You sat there. You became the jury foreman. And then you're going around the country parading white supremacy, parading racial terror as if that's a good thing, as if that's a good thing for the world. What is wrong with you? Nigga, what is wrong with you? Period. Well, I tell you what's wrong with you. All since slavery, almost every single slave revolt that ever happened was well, it didn't work because somebody went and told Massa. Somebody we've been having this for the longest. Uh, some of the, my biggest adversaries in what I'm trying to do happen to be other black people. And and so what I would just generally say is that this has been planted in us for a very long time. I mean, divide and conquer. That's all it is, divide and conquer. They don't want black people unified. They didn't want black people unified two, three hundred years ago. They don't want you unified now. They don't want me sitting here on, on Periscope, Facebook, whatever, talking the, the things, the, saying the things that I'm saying right now. Um, but our window is open. Our opportunity is now. We have the chance to really do this. Nobody's stopping me from talking to you. And so it's very, very important that we make the most of this opportunity before they shut it down. Um, Tina's mentioning that, yeah, he had, yeah, and this brother had a felony. It turns out, go, go read about this brother. I forget this guy's name. This, he's a clown. He's a complete clown. But this clown, he had a felony charge on him when he sat in the jewelry pool, which right there makes me wonder, okay, so how did this black man with a felony, pending felony, not a completed felony, not a felony in his past, but a pending felony charge, get on the jury in the first place? That's what I'm trying to figure out. How did he get on the jury in the first place? And then his charge got dropped the same day he became the foreman of the jury. So the same day he decides to become the foreman of this jury and to guide them away from prosecuting a murderous police officer who was caught on video, that same day, the same Justice Department in that same town drops all his charges. That I mean, if, 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 if that don't reek of corruption, I don't know what does. If, I mean, it's 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 unbelievable, unbelievable, it's unfathomable. So so again, that divine conquer that's been talked to you for a very long time. The next point, in ancient enslavement, slavery provided well, personal wealth and limited benefits directly to individual slaveholders. Slave slavery provided personal wealth and limited benefits directly to individual slaveholder holders. In colonial black enslavement in America, slavery provided wealth for nations and institutions empowered an industrial revolution, and brought modern capitalism to Europe. Let me say that again. Make sure we say this slowly so you get this. Slavery provided wealth for nations and institutions. It empowered an industrial revolution and brought modern capitalism to Europe. So the whole world owes you at least a few trillion dollars. They built like the, the entire economic structure that exists on this earth. The entire global economy that exists today, the majority of that was built by your ancestors through slave labor. Now, are they ever going to make things right? I don't know. I don't know if they're ever going to do the right thing. I don't know. I don't have a lot of faith in this system. But what I will say is that one thing you can control is whether or not how is how you negotiate with these people. Um, personally, when I when they reach out to me and they want to talk to me about getting caught up in some liberal cause, First thing I say is, okay, so what's your opinion on reparations? What what are, what are y'all going to do about reparations for the descendants of slaves? Well, no, well, we got this agenda for gay people and for, uh, for immigrants. No, 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 stop, please stop. No, what are you going to do about reparations for descendants of slaves? Well, we got this other issue. We have women's rights. We got this. No, 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 stop, please. I, I don't want to hear that. Please, no. What are you going to do with regard to reparations for descendants of slaves? If you can't have that conversation then you, we there's nothing to discuss uh if you don't if, if the money let's see somebody says money won't solve the things repeating the past is important um you know what well, I, I i i don't know if you're a troll or if you're a friend or foe whoever said that but actually money does solve a lot of problems i know a whole lot of people who have a lot of problems that could easily be be solved with money a lot of people have a lot of problems that were created due to a lack of money or if money doesn't matter if money doesn't solve problems then fine give us all the money and then you can solve your problems without money how about that how about that? that? There you go. There you go. So anybody who tries to tell me money doesn't matter, money ain't going to make a difference. Okay, fine. Give us the money and then we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll see if you're correct. 
Give us all your money. Since money doesn't matter, give us what give us the shit you got. Alright. Um I'm, I'm gonna uh, take off. Um go if you want to check out our programs, go to blackfinancialliteracy.com. That's blackfinancialliteracy.com. If you want to uh, check out the calendar, um, go to the blackwealthcalendar.com. That's the blackwealthcalendar.com. Uh, if you want to uh, also uh, look at our new film, The Secrets of Black Financial Intelligence, go to blackfinancialintelligence.com. That's blackfinancialintelligence.com. So I'm out of here. I think I'm going to take me a nap. But uh, I appreciate you listening, guys. It's wonderful talking to you. Have an awesome day, and uh, be strong. Take care. Peace.